Hello and welcome to the wonderful world of Innova, alive and composing with today's guest, Mari Kimura. My goodness. Would you please state your name properly for the record? In which language? All of the languages <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> Mari Kimura, as I'm known in this country, Kimura Mari in Japanese, and Marie Kimura Mari Sanzo, which is to say Marie Mari with a without E, Sanzo in French. <laughs> but wait a minute, I thought you were going to spend the rest of your life cleaning, <laughs> scrubbing the floors of a Swiss church. What's that, what's that about? Uh, my husband yeah, um, has a double nationality, French and Swiss. Um, our last name is Bonniman, Bronniman with a umlaut on the O. So his grandfather comes from a little village outside of Bern in Switzerland. And it, it is said that um, um, if any of his uh, offspring and their spouses become as destitute, this church, little church in Switzerland, is obligated to feed us. So my backup plan is, you know, I have in my, my mind, I'm going to be scrubbing the stone floor of the church and pulling the cloche every five minutes. <laughs> that, that, that sounds like a desirable occupation, but especially if you have like some movement controllers, maybe, maybe some gloves on your hand. Maybe I can do one scrub and everything can go like... Phew. Do you think you would have the ability to change the pitch of the bells as, as you can do with a violin? Why not? And have a little robot doing the thing. So. Sounds more like plan A to plan, but plan B. <laughs> but, but let's talk about music for a moment. Early okay. sound. What's your earliest sound memory? Oh, that's interesting. Sound memory? Um, that is a very interesting question because my earliest memory is in Japan and then my more vivid memory is in Ottawa, Canada. So um, this is my first time in Minnesota but it reminds me a lot of that kind of a cool air of Ottawa, Canada that I grew up in. So um, sound or air or some, somewhere it's very wide and open and birds and snow and <laughs> that's really my childhood memory. So. Do you see any relationship or do you hear or feel any relationship between that expansive notion that, that is in your bones and your DNA and the music mm -hmm. that you now engage in? Yeah, well that's a very good question because um, I grew up in Japan mostly but spent two years my form formative years in uh, my daughter, my American daughter, says my pronunciation of ear and years is wrong. So she gets me, my husband and my daughter gets me to drill this and I don't think I got it so correct me. <laughs> formative years, um, was it right? Um, so I think what happened to me was I was four to six years old and um, when I went back to Japan, I never felt uh, integrated in, in Japanese. My, my Japanese was funny because I was talking with pronouns translated into Japanese from English. I was fluent in English back then when I was six. So when I went back to Japan, my Japanese was strange. You know, I spoke translated Japanese. So in Japan, we don't use pronouns like you or he or she. And I would say that in Japanese, so they'll laugh at me. It's like, oh, ha, ha, ha. You know, if I say he, they assume that you're dating somebody or they're just too close. And I never say, you, you know, you don't say you to your father or mother. You know. They'll be insulting. You know, so you say, oh, father, does father want some more tea or something? So that is already in there when I was so small. So I grew up thinking, I don't fit here. I don't fit here. I want to get out of here. I'm getting out of here. <laughs> so that, that may be um, uh, the reason I got out as, as soon as I was allowed to do so. And your ticket, your passport to getting out of Japan, was that a fiddle? Yeah, basically uh, um, I wanted to actually get out um, at high school, but my father said no. You know, he you had to graduate from, from Japan and then, then go. So by the time I was 14 or 15, I was already looking at college applications you know, in India now and all, this, all the places. So yeah, basically I got my violin teacher's right of recommendation to come here. So uh, that's pretty much it. And was that to play the music of other composers or did you find the creative spark within oh, you at that time? Oh, no, no, no. I was like a straight ahead timber, you know, concerto playing, you know, I, I was a serious violinist 
<laughs> now I'm not, right? <laughs> so no, I was I was very classical, um, and I was going to be a classically good violinist, and happily ever after. And then this country completely messed me up. Yeah. So what went wrong? <laughs> <laughs> was it Henry Kaiser or what? <laughs> well, that's a part of it. But um, while I was in Boston, I came to BU, Boston University, to study with Roman Totenberg, uh, who was the um, Polish master uh, teacher, and. Um, um, that was a wonderful experience in itself, but when I was there, I happened to live next door to uh, Marvin Minsky, who was the AI professor. Uh, a friend of mine, um, my colleague, who was his student, introduced me to um, uh, his professor, who he was living there. So I ended up knowing them and, you know, doing all my stuff, and then one day Marvin said in his kitchen, uh, Mari, what are you going to do if you cut, cut off your hand? You just start composing. I said, <laughs> what? <laughs> I mean, if you <laughs> cut off your hand, you probably don't, do, you know, I, it's just a, what well, that was kind of a joke, but silly, but he kind of, I, I had this a blinder, like a horse, I'm going to be doing this Beethoven, Tchaikovsky, Rams, da, 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 da. but then he kind of cut that off, and it's, all of a sudden, I could see the, the world. I was that, you know, very narrow in, um, my my upbringing. And um, so he was influential, not only in cre creating robot intelligence, but, but awakening your intelligence. <laughs> he did wake me up, and uh, I, all of a sudden I, I see the, the, the world is around me. And at the same time, I took a uh, electronic music class, which i never seen before in my life in my conservatory. I went to like a Juilliard of Japan, which was the whole school of music. And they didn't have a course, that maybe there was, but I was not aware of. I did take more composition and analysis class more, more than most violinists because I was bored, really. So um, in Boston, I had to qualify for my uh, uh, visa, uh, student visa. So I had to satisfy the hours that, that I'm a student. So I had to take everything I, I've done already, history, theory. So I had to take something new. So I took electronic music. And that's when I first time I, I learned about music concrete, the you know German... Uh, Cologne, studio, and all that stuff. And then the teacher played me Mary Davidovsky's singer, it was, it's almost for piano, num num number seven. And um, um, I thought, I, I was sitting, I remember I was sitting and listening, I fell off the I basically fell off the chair. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> and I have to do this. This is in 1989 or something, 88. And um, uh, that year he had year, he, he had a commission from MIT to do the violin synchronisms, which I ended up premiering in Japan, for a Japanese premiere. But anyway, so he uh, was in uh, uh, Boston. So I, of course I went to the premiere with Rolf Schulte, uh, the violinist, and uh, you know, if you know Maria Dudaski, he's a tall, you know, very grandiose presence, and I was just a little me, so <laughs> and I don't think I even went up to, you know, say hello, I was too scared. Um, but then um, I was uh, recruited by uh, Joseph Fuchs, a violinist at Juilliard, in a summer camp, Kneisel Hall in Bluefield, Maine. Uh, and I played for him, and he, I remember he was 89 years old or 80 something years old. He was al always turning 90 when I knew him, so I, I'm 90 this year. Again, <laughs> so I don't know how old he was, but he um, he played. I, I remember he played a, a Beethoven's Kreutzer, you know, and his right arm was so perfect. And I know many old violinists; they lose their you know control, but he was right there. And I thought, okay, yeah, right. I have to study this. So um, I he said, you know, you're finishing Boston. Why don't you come to Juilliard? Yeah, I was just going to go back to Japan and be a good person. But then I thought, well, if I go to New York, I'll get killed or raped or whatever. So I thought, okay, maybe one year I, I can survive. So I went to uh, Juilliard for a year, I, I won one year, and then think thought that I will just go back, but then I ended up uh, staying ever since. And that's the that's the time uh, David Asuki came back from Boston in Columbia, and I decided to write a paper about him. You know, And then I thought I can go meet him. So I did a paper on his music, and I basically knocked on his door and said, oh, I'm, I'm a big fan, I'm a big fan. <laughs> and then uh, um, that's, the, the, that's the year that uh, uh, Juilliard and Columbia had an uh, exchange program for the first time. So I think I was the first generation of doing that. 
so I, I said I went to the dean and said um uh, I need to study with him and he said okay fine so uh, there was such a fortunate um you know opportunity for me that I I basically had a private lessons for him for three years for free um, otherwise Columbia is like you know so expensive to go to so I was at Juilliard physically I mean and, and, you know my my presence was at Juilliard but I w was uh, at Columbia and I took some architectural acoustics and that one is a Sarah Harris who um, tried to fix the Avery Fisher Hall he was like a grand old man of architectural acoustics in architecture department and my father studied his, his books and what do I know? You know, audacity of use. So <laughs> I looked him up and I couldn't find his information. So I went to the phone book <laughs> and I called him up at his home. <laughs> and, and I said, uh, hello, um, Professor Harris, um, I'm a student at Juilliard. Can I sit in your class? And he said, sure. <laughs> so I ended up taking his class. Um, and then I, so my first year in New York at Juilliard, I was drawing a section of, and plan of a section of auditorium with the New York city building code and logarithmic table and calculating the you know sound absorbent coefficient and stuff like that have you used that information creatively yeah, uh, yeah. How? yeah well that that was a very good thing to do because i was always interested in how i sound here and there because you know a little tilt of the instrument and when you play high notes and things like that and i always interested in how am i being projected over there and it was very hard for me to make that connection. So, uh, I, I mean, even today, I can kind of tell where I should stand on the stage, you know, an I ideal place to stand, depending on what's behind me and things like that. So I use that knowledge constantly. Is there anything overtly or inexplicably Japanese about your music or your playing? or do, uh, Have you inherited anything from what we would know as traditional Japanese culture or concerns? No idea, but uh, I did grow up, you know, in, in Japan after Canada. Mm -hmm. My father had to move his job, so I did grow up in, in Japan. So environmentally, you know, I heard, I saw all the, the you know, sword fight movies and <laughs> yeah, the sound was around me that with the way people walk is different, the talk and the act is different and you know I, I was part of that society so of course I have that in me. How it comes on my, mu my music, I'm not the, one of those composers who implicitly do that and it comes out that's like a little spice that I have genetically so that's okay. Uh, mu movement you just described and mm -hmm. seems to be an important part of your extended techniques, mm -hmm. your your electronic enhancements. Can you talk a little bit about um, your background as a you know choreographing yourself and making yourself a, a larger presence? Well, that's the thing is though that is, that is very um, incidental, I think, because my instrument, unlike oboe or you know more the instrument that less involves less movement, my arm moves, <laughs> at least my right arm moves. And when I talk to um, researchers at IRCOM, for instance, we say, uh, what does, uh, the first question I asked them when I had a residency, first thing I said, what does a violin or string instrument make a string instrument? It sustains, <laughs> it doesn't pluck, I mean guitar is a pluck, 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 right? And thung, thung, thung. But string instrument sustains. So what does that mean? It's the bow that makes the violin the violin. I mean, there's no bow, it might as well be a mandolin. Yeah? So um, let's track it. So that's how, um, I think that's the most important part of the whole string um, playing is the sustaining motion of whatever it is. So that's how um, it started. Um, the way, you know, we're going to skip ahead but for the uh, uh, motion sensing technology that I use that's very special and important to me um, is that this technology, the particular technology I'm using from IRCOM is nothing like one of those um, Wii remote or you know instrument that this does this, this or glove that can do this if you do this and that if I move too much it's going to... so um, it, it's not implicitly controlling something, it's not a controller, you shouldn't call it a controller, it's more like, oh yeah, you did that, you know, you did this, you did that, 
without thinking about what is this, this going to do or that going to do or this going to do. It analyzes what you do. So if I make a pizzicato, ah, it knows it's a pizzicato. And it, it involves a lot of um, math and trigonometry and physics, and which I don't do, the researchers do that. So I can be what I, can, I am, the violin player, and I do my thing, and the computer would analyze you. So that's the most important thing. I don't have to step on something, and, and I'm very well known in my field that I'm an anti-foot pedal, like I'm a society against foot pedal. So <laughs> I think it's barbaric. <laughs> and it's, it's fine for other people, like Todd, you know, my good friend Todd Reynolds, he's a, really good at doing that kind of thing. I am not, and I'm sh very short, so I have to use this high heel on stage. <laughs> and what happens is I have so many, believe me, I used many foot pedals in my life. If you go dig in a Juilliard in a closet, you see foot pedals in Mari 1, Mari 2, Mari 3, <laughs> so many foot pedals. Um, but I think we have come to 2014 where, you know, the, the humans has to control something. The days of that is, should be over now. The, the machines should know, you, you know, what you're doing. So that's where I like to be and people can be you know who they who they are, and not to the slave of what the machine can know. I mean, we we, we have a we we games for my kids, and you do like tennis or golf or whatever, but it's nothing like the real thing. Right? You have to you have to conform to what it can sense, and that's not acceptable. So, how do you make music with this? What, what's the role of composition and exploration and research and improvisation? Uh, I, I, because you have this uh, expanded resource available to you. Mm -hmm. Uh, can anyone else write for what you do? I, I yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I like to encourage that. And um, my most recent uh, venture or my direction is to uh, disseminate this, the whole technology and the music. And I have just uh, received a grant from Harvest Works to start such a business. <laughs> so uh, my aim is to make this technology as cheaper available and easy to use as possible for anybody and I probably will start with my students and I just give it to them and see how it works. So yes, um, I like I, I would like to propagate it. Can you imagine a whole string quartet of extended players? Now, now you're, you're jumping because I think I'm going to make a grant for that <laughs> a quartet. Actually, already talking to you know friends and. Um, for people do I did a duo piece uh, with two sensors with Dave uh, Egar before and we you know each wore something and what I do would affect him and what he do would affect me and things like that it's still um, you know yeah lots of planning has to go into it so it doesn't become too chaotic lots of these sensor thing um, I hear and I see of other people. It's always very, it's great in exploration stage, but the end product could get messy and uh, too much randomness is monotonous. So you have to really think, you know, it's more of a conceptual uh, question. Now it seems your Innova CD is almost stepping back a little bit into like the traditional skills that you have. Tell us about. Uh, you mean I'm, the Sarvomonics? <laughs> well, well, that too. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't even got to that. T t tell us briefly about subharmonics. I first came across you some years ago sounding a whole octave lower than any violin really ought to be played right. or could play. Right, right. How did you discover that? Yeah, so I'll, I'll be you know, burning on the stake if it's <laughs> 300 years ago. So, um, I mean, it's, it's been, you know, it's on my website and everything that I had this, um, this exercise that I did for ages, years, um, to enhance my tone production. It was taught by um, my first teacher in Canada, who studied with um, Eugenie Zai in was French, Belgian school people. So what it does is to um, put a tiny bit more pressure and go slow speed on the E string to have a, um, notes that, that are difficult to speak, speak better by just improving the um, a friction, rate of friction or speed or something. So I did that for years for my high notes and one 
one winter <laughs> without boyfriend, <laughs> a really cold winter in New York City, I was practicing the Ravel Tsingan. And I thought to myself, okay, I'm going to improve on my lower sound. So I did the same technique on the G string to make it better, you know, sounding. Not to play it like that, but just to improve my sound. And then I start to hear this octave below sound. It's like, what is that? And then that is the year that I was already studying with Davidovsky. So I thought to myself, oh, maybe, you know, maybe I can use this. My, again, I didn't have any boyfriend. I didn't have a life. And I <laughs> My next door neighbor was this deaf woman with seven, eight cats. So, you know, I was safe. And so <laughs> I did that for about two weeks. Okay. I tried to get, eliminate all the uh, transient noise so I get a clean, clean note. In about two weeks, I had it. But I went like, err, Do not do it in front of your spouse <laughs> or partners. Or, or indeed in front of 70 cats. They should be worried. <laughs> <laughs> they would be going, maybe they're all hanging by the nails next door. But um, um, it does sound like that, you know, if you don't do it right. And so, anyway, um, so, so that's how I, I, I um, and then when I had those notes, I mean, no way not to use them. So my first uh, piece um, I, you know, played for Dudowski, he said, well, I never heard anything like this. So that was my name of the piece, ALT, anything like this. <laughs> so that that piece is uh, um, on the um, um, CD, my previous CD. So the current Innova CD is what? Okay, so so that is in 1992. The first time I did it in 1992, I did not make it public. I kept it quite secret until I was sure that this is not just a novel to your strange trick, but I can really musically use it. So I presented it in my uh, League of Composer IESCM concert in Marken, my New York debut concert um, in 94. And then since then, uh, I mean, that kind of, that's a whole another story that then I was invited to physics conference and the people who were most interested were not composers, not violinists, but physicists. And they went mad, they went all good, crazy, blah, 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 stuff. So that's sort of another whole area that I did. But then um, by chance, around the same time, like 94, 95-ish, I was playing this octave below sound and I noticed there are other notes there. So if I play uh, middle C, I get the uh, viola C, right, for octave below. But then I heard other notes, other pitches that are transient. And that was minor third below. So if I play the C, too bad I don't have a violin, I can show you. Um, so there'll be A below the middle C. I get a minor third below. So I, you know, did this you know, cat thing again. <laughs> so I have a minor third below and minor uh, octave below. So I got two pitches on the same note. So that, I made a piece using that. You know, it's called Jemmy and too. And uh, how you get it is the best I can describe it is a slightly s a faster bow and slightly less pressure. That's all I can say because that changes depending on, um, I don't know, the, the, the string or whatever. But the change, the, the control is relative. So if you, it takes this much. The violin playing is pretty much like an arc, so you go like this, right? But for Saromanic, you can, you have to put the, the pressure like this and like that. <laughs> I don't know how to, it's like a wooden block, you have to get to that, you know. It's very much like a brass, I think, to, to generate those harmonics. It's, it's practically the same, I think. So anyway, <laughs> so if it's, the octave is like this, if octave is like that, the third is like that, right? So, <laughs> Like this, like that. Um, then I thought to myself, okay, if I have a minor third, there has to be a fifth or something else. And of course there was, of course, I'm sure. I would hear it like split second. Oh my God, I just heard a fifth. Oh, I, oh my God. Then I go on to my cave, woman cave, <laughs> and nothing came, you know, nothing came of it. And I thought, okay, so there isn't. And in the meantime, I also discovered minor second. So I have a, uh, if, I, if I play an open G, 
I get F sharp below it. It's just a slight bending thing. And the phys uh, in physics, there's a different category of this, like a bending effect. Or, but we don't know. I don't know what I'm doing, really. I'm just... And, and then, you know, I got married and had kids, and then, and then, and then I kept thinking about the fifth, kept thinking about the fifth, because there has to be a fifth. It would be so great if there's a fifth. I mean, compositionally speaking, it's a great thing to have a fifth. So I kept thinking about it, and in 2010, I had this fortunate um, um, residency for three months in Paris, alone. The kids, uh, my family-in-law took them in, bless their heart. So, you know, I had a time to myself for the first time in a very long time. And I decided to, although this was for the motion sensor residency, I decided to take a half an hour every day to do this every exploration of it. Every morning I did a half an hour, half an hour, and I kept hearing it. And, and that summer I was sure there is a fifth. That's far as I got. <laughs> okay. not, not far, not far at all. But until then, I thought it was like my, my, my dream. But I, I knew, you know, I knew in the summer of 2010 that I, I know there was a fifth. So I didn't get it this summer, but following uh, January, I got it. So now there's a new piece for that, and that will be on the university. All right. The first uh, piece using third octave and a fifth. Well, it certainly sounds more than just a demonstration. It sounds like incredible music in the, in the hands and the body of a wonderful person. So well, thank you so much. <laughs> so thank you so much, thank Marie you. Kimura. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. I spoke too much. <laughs>